Looking round I finally see I think I need a change The rat race I wanna flee My world I'll rearrange I'm getting back to the roots Of how it's meant to be Growing gardens, picking fruit Racing livestock, living free Hello and welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. My name is Harold Thornbrew and I'm joined as usual by my friend and co-host Rachel Jameson. How you doing, Rachel? Oh, pretty good. I got a little bit of a, a frog in my throat today, so let's hope we can uh, manage <laughs> well, through this. Frogs aside, we're going to bring you a podcast anyway. <laughs> <laughs> on this podcast, we just have conversations about, well, anything homesteading related. We either have talked about it or we're planning on probably talking about it someday. So if that uh, is something you think you enjoy, I think you'll like this podcast. And today we're going to talk about 17 useful flowers to grow on your homestead. There's probably way, way, way more useful flowers you could grow on your homestead. We kind of just stopped at 17. You put a few, I put a few, and I think we've got a pretty good list here today. Yeah, we do. Yeah. So uh, what's been going on in your homestead this week? Oh, well, we finally have gotten a cold snap. I mean, maybe we've had one before, but it seems like it's been a pretty mild winter. So we had that um, real cold snap a few weeks ago, but yeah. Yeah. So now it's, it's pretty cold here. So I'm bundled up, but I need to go outside and do a couple of things today. But, um, <laughs> Otherwise, I've just been kind of inside and planning. It's that time of year where it's cold out and you're sitting through your seeds and mm -hmm. I've been doing some planning and um, I've decided I'm planting more flowers. This so episode this, this, help with that? Yeah, this subject <laughs> is a little bit selfish here today. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I too am planning on planting a lot more. I, I actually planned on it last year and I had a lot of failed seeds because I just got some bad seeds, I think. But yeah, flowers are going to be a huge part of my homestead this year as well for a lot of reasons. And they have yeah. been before. I mean, I've planted a lot of flowers, but yeah, this year I right. think it's definitely going to take a little, even more priority. Um, but yeah, for me, it's it's turned cold. It's still cold here and you know, we got some snow and so it ain't a lot of outside stuff. But honestly, not even a lot of inside stuff for me either. I mean, it's just basic homestead chores and it's kind of like a season, a season of writing for me. I've, I've kind of maybe even overcommitted myself to some writing projects. <laughs> so, um, in the last couple of weeks and the next couple of weeks, I, it's been a lot of just writing stuff. I've been writing a lot of posts. Uh, I actually have some posts on uh, permaculture news, which is the permaculture research Institute, which I'm, I'm excited about that. I feel good about that because they've always been a, a major influence on me and I've learned a lot from them. So it actually be writing some articles on their website. It's been fun for me. I've enjoyed that. Uh, it just came out today. This is Monday. We're recording this, um, an online magazine, uh, that, um, invited me to write an article for, and that came out today. So I seen that, uh, magazine came out today. It's called Prairie Dust Trail, I think is what it's called. I never heard of it. And it's not for everybody because it's homesteading, um, from a Christian perspective and I'm a Christian. So it was just, it was kind of an outlet for me to write in that magazine. So it was, it was, it was a fun little project there. So I got to write for that. But I also have to finish a book before a deadline of February 20th. So I've got quite a ways to go on that yet. So I'm really uh, hammering on that here for the last couple of weeks and the next couple of weeks I got to get that done. So uh, I, I'm on pace to get it done. But uh, yeah, I'm really having to focus and kind of just get on that really quite a bit every yeah. day. Try to write a couple you hours. You really and, enjoy writing. I wish I enjoyed it as uh, much as you do. I, I have seasons where I enjoy it and I have seasons where it feels like it's a lot of, it's a burden, you know, sometimes, uh, but sometimes I love it. Like if I get in the mood to write, um, I really enjoy it. But then I have times where I have to really make myself sit down and just start typing. And, and even then deadlines actually help me. If I, if I have all the time in the world to write something, I seem to take all the time in the world to write it. So I enjoy having uh, deadlines. I really do. So I, I like that I have a deadline coming up on this book. because It's really caused me to to sit down and, and just hammer it out. But it's that's going to end up being available in a, a bundle that's going to be out. And uh, well, I'll be talking more about that when that's um, that another. The, yeah, uh, remind us when uh, that's. Yeah, a place that hosts these, these homestead bundles. Uh, they, they put books and material together that you can buy a bundle. And that book will be available in that when it comes out. So I'm just trying to get it all done for that. 
I think that'll be in March. So we'll definitely talk about that when it comes around. But yeah, that's that's been It'll homesteading be for me. Before lately. we know it, March oh, will be. Hasn't time just been flying by? It seems like I this can't last believe it's going to be February. Oh, it's crazy. I I think it's. I probably say it every year, but it seemed like this last year was the fastest year of my life. But I would right. probably say that every year. It just seems like time goes by so fast. Days go by slow, but weeks and months and years go by fast. You know, I don't know. It's kind of weird. It seems like my days go by fast, and you would think that this time of year they wouldn't. But I'm like, they, they go slow when I'm at work. <laughs> but right. other than that, oh yes, for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I totally get that. But yeah, yeah. So, so what did you? Uh, so we have started this new little segment on today's recommended books. What I guess books we should call that you? this week's recommended books because it's usually weekly, actually. Yeah, <laughs> this week. <laughs> Uh, I picked one that I've had on my bookshelf for a long, long time, but it's one of my favorites. And it was actually a major influence for me for, um, permaculture. It was Gaia's garden, a guide to home scale permaculture. Toby Hemingway wrote that book. It's a great book. If you're, um, especially, a, I would say acre or less homesteader. Yeah. Um, now I mean th the teachings then are applicable to any size homestead, obviously, but it's really focuses on small scale permaculture. And if you're new to permaculture and you're really wanting to, and you're on a smaller scale property, that is the book right there. I mean, and what I love about that book more than some others is the practicality of it. I mean, it's just like, here are things you can do and here is how you do it. I mean, right. that I love that. It's not all philosophy or you know potential it's this this is what works this is what you can do and this is how you can make a difference turning your property into a permaculture property i love it it's just a great book for that um and it gave me a ton of ideas early on when i started kind of making the transition into permaculture from what i would just say just homesteading you know um so yeah great book i highly recommend it and there'll be a link in the show notes for that one cool well my pick this week was a um it's kind of a cookbook, but it's also kind of a nutrition book. It's called mm -hmm. Nourishing Traditions by Sally Fallon. Yep. Um, Sally Fallon is a Weston A. Price Foundation. I'm not sure if she's the founder. I believe she might be. I think she but, was the um, founder, yeah. Yeah, but she she wrote a book in conjunction with some other people. And, and the book is really just like a lot of recipes, but also a lot of information about health and a more traditional diet book. Yeah. So it talks about how to make bone broth and how to make sourdough and how to um, soak your nuts properly and soak and sprout your grains properly and dry them. So it's really kind of a foundational cookbook. It's not necessarily gluten-free. In fact, I don't know. I mean, it has some gluten-free things in it. So, um, but it just has, I find it, has a lot of information, especially if you're starting down this road of wanting to um, make bone broth and broth and learn how to make pate and eating your organ meats and just lots mm -hmm. of traditional recipes in there using yeah. a lot of different kinds of grains too. I mean, the, there's, it's not just wheat, it's a millet and just lots of different things. It's really good. Um, it's a pretty thick book full of lots of information. Mm -hmm. So anyway, there's a link. To that. A lot of the Weston A. Price stuff is controversial for some people. Yes, um, yes. There's a lot of things that people just don't agree with. And right. I think to to get a lot from this book, you don't have to agree with everything. No, you don't. Either no. There's a lot of stuff in here that would benefit you that you don't have to agree with everything right. that that foundation stands for as far as like the what their diet is, what they would consider the yeah. ultimate diet. And, and they're like really that. big on dairy yeah. products. Yeah. Um, so. You can appreciate this book without being big on dairy products. Right. Um, yeah. They're really big on the fact that people can heal and not, and that and return to foods that they were, you know, intolerant to and possibly even allergic to. I'm not saying I agree with that. I'm a celiac. I'll always be a celiac. I don't think I'll ever heal from that. Um, but it's it's a good book. It's got yeah. lots of recipes in there and how to start and how to soak and sprout and ferment um foods and grains and all Absolutely. of that kind of stuff. It yeah. makes the it, it is a really good place to yep, start if you're trying to learn um to make food really nutritious, especially staple foods that are a little bit cheaper, like some of your grains and mm -hmm. 
stuff, it, it helps um, learn how to prepare those so that you can get the most out of them. Yep, definitely one worth having on your shelf for any homesteader. Yeah. I agree because we've said many times, cooking food preparation is in my opinion, the most important skill you right. will learn as a homesteader. And this book can definitely help contribute to that for sure. So link for that one is in the show notes as well. Yeah. Good yep. stuff. Well, we'll move on to our topic, 17 useful flowers to grow on your homestead. And I was a little late getting to the uh, show notes here and you put in a, quite a few before I started putting in some. So uh, I'll let you just jump right into the first one that you put on the list. Well, I was kind of surprised we came up with 17 because I think when we talked about this, we were worried about coming up with. <laughs> so, so <laughs> I think we, we probably could have, I had a few others too. And I was like, yeah. I think this is probably enough. <laughs> yeah. These are the ones I just kind of threw off the top of my head. Like, what do I have in the garden and what am I starting this year? So mm -hmm. this first one I put in here was calendula. 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 I think I'll pronounce it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is an annual, but the seeds are really easy to save. Um, mm -hmm. but you, t you can direct sow this outside or you can start it inside. I start mine a little sooner inside because I want to, I want them to be started as plants because our grow season is so short here. Yeah. I like to have the benefits as soon as I possibly can. Sure. Um, it's a pretty little flower. It's orange and yellow and it's a member of the sunflower family and it likes rich soil. So a few of these plants that I've added don't necessarily love my garden soil. And I will mention that later, but <laughs> this one does love my garden soil. Um, one of the things I really like about this is it's just such a wide use flower and it's so pretty, mm -hmm. but you can use it medicinally. You can eat it. You can put it on your skin. Um, it's great for a tea, but it also helps with pest management. If you interplant it, and sow it within um, like your cabbage it helps with mm -hmm. cabbage worms, which I totally forgot about that last year. And I had issues with cabbage worms. So this year I'm going to be sowing. I think I'm going to be growing a lot more calendula after this conversation than I, yeah, think I didn't I know it was going to for cabbage worms, but that might be something I need to plant a little closer. I mean, the only thing I found to fix cabbage worms is cover my cabbage. But right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah, if I could do it with some plants, that would even be better. I think I might have to do both. I'm going to do both because yeah. last year I had a lot of cabbage worms. And, um, and you know, and it also helps um, with the soil food web. You know, we've talked about that a lot. And mm -hmm. all of these plants can help with that. So anyway, that was my first pick. Yeah, I see you added a link to for an article, yeah. other uses for calendula. What, what did you happen to notice in some of your research about what, what are some of the... Um, the uh, benefits for the medicinal benefits of it, as far as using it for like teas or or whatnot. Do you know any uh, what it would be used for? I, so now I use it for medicinally. I think it's really good for the skin. I use okay. it in a lot of salves and like um like you mix it with tallow, which has its own medicinal properties, and um it helps with skin, just like tallow will. So. Okay. Okay. I was just curious. I know that it's used as a medicinal thing. I just didn't know what people were actually using it for. Um, I've actually never used it. So I would like to maybe grow, grow it. Really? You've never used it? I I, ha I tried to plant it last year. And I think I had one come up <laughs> out of all of my planted. So it didn't do well. Um, so, really? yeah. Okay. Well, I told you them seeds I got last year were just horrible. I tried a whole bunch of stuff. I think I was like, I don't even know how many was in this. It was just like this. I bought this packet. That had all these different herbs and flowers and all this the medicinal stuff. You know, it was a medicinal herb pack. Okay. It had like, all, I mean, dozens of different kinds of things. So I tried and I filled all these raised beds up with all these. I sectioned them off, put my tags in. I had them all set up. I thought, I'm going to have me a great little herb garden here. And right. just like 98% of it didn't grow. <laughs> it was horrible. <laughs> I have had that happen before. I think it was some plants that I bought on Et or some seeds I bought on Etsy. I didn't have the greatest luck with, but yeah, I bought yeah. So we use Amazon. it a lot, like um, rashes or itchiness. I yeah. usually combine it with like tallow and lavender, and um, yeah, it's got a lot of antioxidants and stuff in it. So awesome, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's just pretty. It's a pretty little flower. Now the next one you have on here. Now I've bought. Um, the the little packets to make like tea with, but I've never okay. grown the plant. 
I mean, I actually bought some, but I've never uh, grown the plant. And I'd like to, though. Um, yeah. Tell us about hyssop. I love hyssop. So um, it is, it's kind of a flower, but it's more of a little short shrub. Uh-huh. And it is perennial. It will, um, it will continue to come back. And I'm in grow zone five, so I've never had an issue to come with it coming back and we've cut it and then it just, it comes back. So the nice part about hyssop is you can use the flowers in the fresh stems before they get woody, like when they're um, like the fresh growth Mm -hmm. stems, but it is, it's hardy even up here. It's a perennial even up here in zone five. So it's um, a perennial for zone four to nine. And, um, I started mine from seeds, but it, it's actually easier to grow from cuttings, but it really? will spread okay. a little bit. Now this says it spreads easily and maybe that's more in, um, warmer climates. Cause I really haven't had issues with it spreading. Really? And if it okay. does, it doesn't spread that much, at least here. Um, well, it's a member of the mint family. So yeah, yeah but it does not sense. spread like my other not mint. Like mint. Yeah. No, I've had this <laughs> plant in the ground for I think I've had this one for three years. I have two of them. I have anise hyssop and licorice hyssop. And um, they they have gotten a little bigger, but not like my mint where it is. I can't even control mint. Like yeah. you dig it up and it just keeps going and going and going and you just can't even control it. So it to me, I mean, now maybe somebody's going to say that it is grows wild, but up here in zone five, it doesn't seem to grow as wild. But it, it does like sun. It does like well-drained soil. Um, I'm going to be using it in some of my tree guilds because it's really like the insects love it. Like bees and butterflies are always all over it. And it's got this beautiful smell. It smells, it's just really fragrant and the mm-hmm. everything loves it. And then um, I also use it for teas. The, the leaves taste like the licorice hip, hyssop actually tastes like you're eating yeah. black licorice. It is I've, just I've had the amazing. tea and I really like it. It's why I want to grow it and I, I haven't yet. But yeah, I definitely want to add that to my because I love the tea. I love hyssop tea. Oh, yeah, it is. It is so tasty. Um, I I try to avoid sugar, but I love licorice. So this is kind of one way for mm-hmm. me to... <laughs> Get a little bit of a fix is you can go out there. I mean, I've been known to just be out in the garden, working in the garden and grab leaves and to be chewing on them. Oh, they're yeah. Just, they're not, you know how some leaves, they're great as tea, but they're not so great if you chew yeah. on them. These ones, they don't have any pickers or anything. So, yeah, I do that with mint, like good. spearmint. We have spearmint here and I'll just grab a couple of leaves and toss my mouth and chew it like gum. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, um, so those flowers, I can't remember. The flowers can be lavender, pink, or white. And I think both of the ones that I have are are lavender flowers. Um, but they're just, they're so pretty. And like I said, I'm going to be putting it in with my fruit tree guilds. And, um, and then it's got some medicinal purposes too. So, yeah, you know, like lots of, a lot of these will have both medicinal and, um, benefits to your garden like as far as attracting good bugs these also will attract bad bugs so they will attract bad bugs away from your so it'd be a good trap your, crop yeah, yeah trap it's like crop. a trap crop i guess that's yeah. the word to use is the trap crop but yeah yeah so that's and it's bad. easy to collect and it's um you know another one of those that you could probably put in a little bit of a cut flower vase if you wanted to bring it inside mm-hmm. so but it's a perennial, so it'll it'll come back. Yeah, yeah. Way, Even here so. it does. And this says that they don't get that tall, which I found interesting because I'm trying to fe- see where it was. This was saying that they only got like 36 inches tall. That's three my, feet. My, That's a pretty tall plant. <laughs> mine actually, I think, got taller. I don't know if it's because it was wanting sun, but where it's at, it gets full sun. It's reaching for it, huh? <laughs> yeah. So anyways, it's... Yeah. It's a nice little plant. It's a fragrant. Well, the next one's a common one for people. People know a lot about it. A lot of people grow it. Maybe they don't even grow it because of its usefulness, but they grow it just because it's beautiful. And that's a rose. I mean, uh, if you have a rose yeah. bush, 
it's a useful plant. It ain't just for looking at. And, and, um, I, we have rose here and, uh, I love it. It's perennial. That thing blooms. It's funny. Mine actually blooms like twice a year. Um, okay. we will get it and we'll kind of dead, deadhead it. And then usually like late, late fall, like I've had it like, um, get snow on the ground. And it usually what's funny about mine is, and I can't even tell you exactly what kind it is, but like, it'll generally have like a, a different color flower the second time it blooms, which is right. weird. But when it blooms again, it'll be like, we had it, um, it didn't happen this year because we got a really bad cold snap. So it kind of killed it dead. I mean, it, not can kill it, but I mean, it went dormant. Um, but last year or the previous couple of years, it's like we would get snow on the ground and then it would kind of like warm up a little bit and then it would bloom with snow on the ground, okay. which was funny to me, but now is yours a, um, do you know what breed yours is? I don't. Is that's why like so many different varieties. There are different ones. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know. I ended up picking, I think I bought it like Walmart years ago. Okay. I mean, it's been on our property for a long time and it's, just, it was just a beautiful flower. But then I started learning about kind of the usefulness of it and stuff. And, oh yeah. you know, and, uh, rose hip tea, we started doing the rose hip tea. I love that. It's so good. I never even knew much about it. Um, but I really liked it. Now I haven't got into making things with it, like lotions and salves. You may have, I don't know. I have. have ever... yeah. yeah. And I love, like, I have used the rose hips cause they have so much vitamin C in yeah, them. Yeah. Really nutritious. But I just recently, now I bought this cause I don't have roses yet. I bought some Rosa Ragusa mm -hmm. and those should be coming in the mail. Um, I want to, I can't remember where I bought them. It was, I think it's cold, cold water is where I got them. But, um, I got those just because they're a little bit more hardy than like your regular rose mm -hmm. plants sometimes are a little bit harder to grow. Um, but I like using the petals in tea. Yeah. And then the fragrance of the petals too, which is mm -hmm. what I put in a tallow balm. Yeah. Was that. And, there, and the rose, if you make rose water or rose essential oil, which I haven't made essential oil, but rose water, it's just really great for the skin. Yeah, but I love rose tea. I know it sounds weird if you think about it, but it's actually really good. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I've never moved petals. I've used the rose hips or the, you know, the hips, and and I really like that. Um, it, I mean, it's also I see a lot of bees around it. I mean, the bees mm -hmm. love it, so it's a great pollinator yeah. uh, uh, flower. Um, and it it is a heavy feeder. Uh, I do put a lot of compost around it in the fall and okay. kind of let it set in the ground. So it does seem like it needs, but mine does really, really well. And I don't know what, like I said, I don't know what variety it is, variety it is but it seems to grow really good. I mean, it gets really long and I'll chop it back a little bit because it's a very thorny one. Mine's got some big thorns on it. Right. Which can be a benefit. But, yeah. Yeah, it can. And, and I've also heard that it's not good to have, it's not a good companion plant for some plants. It's a good companion plant for other plants. And what's funny is I heard it wasn't a good companion plant for strawberries. And then where do I have mine in the strawberry? Bed. Oh, interesting. <laughs> it's never seemed to have an effect, but I did read that later and i was like oh well i guess i messed up but it doesn't seem to be having any kind of effect on my strawberries so it, i guess it's okay now what but color actually, are yours uh are they well red? they're red in okay when they bloom in the spring late spring they generally bloom and they're red but then every time they've bloomed in like late fall early winter they've been yellow which is weird i don't know it's like they change colors i don't know what that's about oh. i don't know if it's because of nutrient difference because I think that, that usually happens wild. after I dump the compost on it, maybe. I don't know. But, it, yeah, they, they're they like a red in the spring and then a yellow in the winter. Well, it is a plant that I cannot wait to have arrive and um, add to my flowers because I, <laughs> I like roses. Yeah, and they, it seems to grow really easy. And other than just adding some compost, I don't put really any care into it. Okay. Um, mine, anyway. So, I don't know. Maybe it, I don't know what breed, what breed it is, but it does really well. So, and like I said, I picked it up at a Walmart, so it does pretty good for, hey, yeah. you know, cheap plant that I bought. Um, this one I don't grow. I, this is another one that I tried to grow this next one that I tried to go last year. Didn't grow. Tell us about lavender. Lavender. I think <laughs> everybody probably knows what lavender smells like. And um, maybe they don't know what it looks like, but I think everybody knows what it smells like. But it's a perennial. Well, I'm, I'm going to restate this. I did grow it once before. Okay. In a pot. I okay. grew it in a planter I had in the backyard, and then I dumped it out. I didn't, because I remember I did that because it there was a danger of it spreading around, um, because it was perennial, I guess, that spreads. And I just want to throw that in there, because I do, I do remember 
having it like one of them barrel planters in the back a few years ago. And I don't even know why I didn't continue going on, but I did have it one time. Yeah. Huh. Mine have not mine hasn't really spread. It's grown, but it's not again, it's a not one of those where it's like mint where it's like invasive. It, it's yeah. gotten bigger, but it hasn't become invasive. But um you can start it from seed, which is how I started mine. But I will say I have attempted to start it from start probably at least 20 lavender plants from seed and only been successful with two. So it's a lot We're easier no to grow from cuttings. Okay. Yeah. Maybe so that's, that, and again, that's one of the seeds I tried to grow last year. Maybe it didn't. I, yeah, yeah. They're, I've gotten them. That <clears> makes <throat> sense. I've, yeah. Yeah. And the ones that I have gotten to grow, they get to maybe like an inch big. And I think I finally have it going and then something happens and they die. So they're a lot easier. At, they've, I've read they're a lot easier to take from cuttings. So this year I'm going to be trying doing some cuttings from my plant that I have. Um, the ones I grew in the barrel, they, they, I did buy a plant, a couple okay. of plants to put in that. And then they grew from there. That makes sense. Because like I said, I couldn't really grow them from the seed. They didn't take off from seed. So that might've been why. Yeah. They're yeah. More difficult I, to grow from seed. They're just kind of difficult. And they, um, but apparently the cuttings are a lot easier in mine. So I also killed one by putting it in my garden, which is pretty decent soil at this point. Mm -hmm. And then I read that they kind of like poor soil mm -hmm. that is well draining. So I moved the plants out by our mailbox where it's like mostly sand and it's really sunny and hot and kind of dry and it loves it. So um, if you had issues with it in your garden where it's more fertile and you're growing vegetables, you might want to move it to a more <laughs> neglected place. Mine <laughs> seems to be thriving on neglect. Yeah. But um, they're just beautiful. They have purple flowers. They have different varieties. Some of them are real low to the ground. Some of them can get quite tall. Um, you can use them as cut flowers. People use them. And sachets to put in their drawers because they smell good. And the smell stays pretty for yeah, a long I love, time. I love them. the smell. Of yeah. A lot of people yeah. put them in soaps and things like that. Because soaps. Of, because of and, yeah. Yeah. And you can eat them. I have a couple of lavender cake recipes. Um, I have a friend that used to make lavender lemonade. <laughs> you were telling me about that. I was kind of fascinated sell it. by that. Yeah. Yeah. And it actually has a pretty interesting flavor. So, and then of course it's a beneficial, the bees and the butterflies like it. But one of the good things, one of the reasons I like having it out by the road is apparently it deters deer. Um, that is interesting. It, that might be something for a lot of people who have, you know, homesteads more yeah. out in a, uh, you know, an area where there's a huge deer uh, problem and pressure. Yeah, that might be uh, something to consider spreading around the outskirts of your property. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to, I think I'm going to have to try to get more of it to grow because um, I said last week week but maybe it wasn't it's hard for me to sometimes remember what we talked about and then what was actually on the podcast but um you know we've had we have some neighbors that are elderly and they, they go away and they're not here all winter and the deer have noticed that our neighborhood's a little quieter mm. and so they've been creeping in and i'm getting a little concerned about my garden this summer because yeah, they're no a little too comfortable so, it might make a really good plant to put in like guilds right directly around a tree yeah. that, you know, maybe mask the smell or or just you know deter them in that way yeah i think i'm going to try that this year um see if i can get it to do well in the guilds with like my fruit trees but like i've said before mine have always done really good being neglected and with my fruit trees i've been trying to keep them um well fed so i mm -hmm. guess we'll see so Okay, well, we're going to talk about violet. Um, have you ever I, grown violet or um, I have, pansies? I have. I've bought, like, you'll go down to, you know, wherever, and you get the little four packs or eight packs or whatever, and plant a few for decoration along the walkway or something like that. But I've never really planted them for any kind of use. It was more like just decoration along a walkway or something. Okay, yeah. So, I, yeah, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about the the usefulness of the violet. Oh, well, Violet, we have, I have planted pansy, which is a member of the Violet family of violets. There's a lot of different breeds. Uh -huh. um, there's some that you, like the pansy, are a little bit harder to grow. They like cooler weather. They like a little bit of shade. And I have grown those and 
the pet the flowers themselves are edible and they taste really good in a salad i didn't even know they were um, edible when we grew them uh, pansies yeah. are what we actually grew because that's what you go down and buy and then the animal right. yep. you know plant them alongside but yeah i didn't even know they were edible yeah they are but then i also have wild violets mm. um i don't know i i honestly wouldn't encourage you to plant them unless you were going to put them in a container because consider them like mint <laughs> They will really that that much. Oh oh my word! (laughs) I'll have to send. I'll send pictures this summer, but I'm constantly trying to keep it out of my garden. I don't know where it came from, but we have wild violet, and it just it grows by seed and by runners that run into the garden, and I'm constantly trying to keep it out. But it is you can eat the leaves and the flowers. Okay. And they're pretty good. I just don't need thousands of them. <laughs> but um, but if you're going to grow uh, like a, the pansy, which is not a perennial and isn't invasive, you would start those eight to 10 weeks before inside. And then you're going to want to have them in the cooler part of the summer or maybe even the fall. But they're not going to like the heat of summer. And this is why we wanted to kind of do this episode also right now, because like we talked about onions on the last episode yeah. we did together. Um there's a time when you have to kind of plant early, you know, and this is a, some of these flowers, a, a few of these, yeah. you're going to, if you grow from seed, you're going to want to get those started, you know, probably pretty soon, a week or two after you start your onion seeds. So, um, because it, again, it just takes them a while to, to get to a point where you can transplant them into your garden and you're going to get, and especially if they're a, a cooler weather flower, like they're going to do best when it's cool. They're not going to, you know, the heat of summer is not when you're going to even, they're going to start dying back and not grow as well. So you're going to want to get that to where they're growing really well when you transplant them and get that early uh, flower from them. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, I have used this in hummus. And so I'm putting a link to the hummus recipe that I use. Um, But, you know, it does have some medicinal uses too but mostly just like all plants you know they just have um they usually have a lot of a vitamin a and antioxidants in them and and this is this is really similar yeah so yep would you say it'd be good for just like maybe dropping some in a a salad and just eating fresh like that it's really good like you can mix it the the hummus recipe actually mixes it with chickweed i haven't done that I just use um, I just used the violet with the hummus, which is chickpeas. But um, yeah, you can just put the little flowers on top of your salad, and it makes this it makes it look really pretty if you're having guests over or something. Yeah. But also, they just have this. Each of these flowers have like a different flavor. Like later, I'll be talking about another flower that instead of having a little bit of a sweet flavor, it's actually kind of spicy. Yeah. I would, yeah. There's one on, so. I added on the list too. That's like that kind of peppery and spicy and yeah. Also. Yeah. Yeah. I can't so even they're believe, all a little different. I, I can't even believe you put this next one on the list. I mean, don't you know that that next one is the, the bane of people's existence? I mean, they don't want this one on their list. I mean, how dare you mention the dandelion? Because it's so medicinal. <laughs> it is. It's a great, it's a great flower and people hate it. And it's just a great they flower. Do. I even wrote that. I said, I said right here, probably the most hated plant for many because it pops up in lawns <laughs> yeah, and everybody yeah. wants that green lawn. And guess what? You get this little green lawn. And then the next thing you know, there's all these ye- yellow flowers, but um, they're one of uh, the bees first plants in the spring yeah. which is really nice the bees have spent all yep. winter kind of starving and so it's nice for them to get that plant but um my grandmother used to make salad greens my mom talks tells the story about my having to go out and collect dandelion greens for salads yeah i used to eat a lot of i mean i've ate a lot yeah. of dandelion greens and make nice and make a great salad when yeah, they're, kids, when they're young seeds. once they get bigger they get a little tougher and yeah, they get kind of yeah. they're just not near as good but when you get them when they first come up and those leaves and they're smaller of course but they're really super tender and they just got a good taste to them and you can literally eat it like you would a loose leaf salad i mean just the yeah. whole salad and they're it's, really good i i like them really yeah and good. it's so good for your liver and yeah. i'm not sure the only part of it that I think isn't edible is the stem. I think is it's that, edible. It's you, just not good. It's really bitter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you can eat it. It is. The I tell you something, a way I like to eat them that's not healthy at all, but it's very good is uh, to uh, batter and fry the dandelion flour. 
Really? I've and never it had it like tastes, that. It, it honestly tastes a lot like uh, you ever do like uh, mushrooms like that. It tastes a lot okay. like a mushroom. It's really good. And Interesting. I, yeah. It is like I said, not the healthiest way, obviously, to eat it, but it's I do it right. every year. They just get one batch of them like that and eat them and they're really, really good. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, this flower, it's so you can eat the flower. And then I've heard of making dandelion jelly, which I haven't, but I've heard it tastes I, like I have honey. Made dandelion jelly. Okay. It's really good. Yep. Yeah. It tastes like honey. Is that what you think? Uh, it's sweet, but I wouldn't say okay. it tastes like honey. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then the root, of course, you can use it's bitter. So when I make mock coffee... I will make it with <laughs> I was wondering if you were going to mention the coffee substitute yeah. or not. It, it's, I will make chicory root and mix it with dandelion root. And that dandelion yeah. bitterness does make it taste really similar to coffee. It can be. It, but the, and there is a huge uh, medicinal benefit to that, too. Yes. I mean, it's a, it has a lot of the, the root. It's really, really good healthy. for your liver. Yeah. 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 And, and you're just told digestive system, really, mm -hmm. from what I understand. Yep. It's really good for you. So I have done the coffee as well. We'll say coffee with quotes around that. Yes, coffee it, with it's quotes. not coffee, but it, no. if it is a replacement. It doesn't taste like, I don't think it tastes like, I mean, maybe the, with the chicory root, it does. I'm not trying to. If you it that mix way. it together with the chicory root okay, together, I drink it's it straight. similar. It does not taste anything like coffee. No, it doesn't. But if you're looking for an alternative to some for something yeah. to drink like coffee that's, you know, warm and I don't know, it, it's a it's good for you. Yeah. And it's it's okay. I wouldn't say the it's great. The two together, I think, taste similar to coffee. No, they're not going to give you any caffeine. Okay, I'll have to try they, that. Yeah. They're I'm similar that flavored. Sometime. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good, um, good to know. And then the other thing about dandelion that a lot of people don't know is dandelion has that long tap root, and that's basically a dynamic accumulator yep. which is a root a plant that will bring up minerals and stuff from yeah down below for your yard and stuff so yeah, yeah. so when it dies back it's putting a lot of those nutrients back on top of the yeah. soil rather than deep down in yeah yeah so. good good stuff yeah i think dandelions are people hate you it can but it's, buy it's a, them I can seen, buy dandelion seed and I've I, seen and, yeah yeah i think it like some probably of the bigger, don't need to where you're at you probably, probably probably not. You wait till probably... see those little fluffy balls and then go up and just steal some and then you know, off those little but when, they, when they go to do seed. Buy dandelion greens yeah. or they do buy dandelion roots to make coffee and stuff like that. I, so. I've seen something really neat. There's always around springtime, there's always a lot of people that try to promote the fact that you should leave the dandelions for the bees and stuff like that. So there's a lot of people who who are just for the the bees that are trying to say, hey, let's give them some food source, right? And I've seen a neat alternative to that uh the other day where everybody wants their yard mode and they want it to look nice but why not just take a at least at the very least a patch a 10 by 10 patch and just leave that area and leave right. the dandelions growing up in that area you know and just that way you're you know maybe somewhere that isn't quite as visible from the road or whatever where you can let some flowers grow let some dandelions grow and feed the bees and if everybody did that in a neighborhood or in an area There'd be enough, you know, it doesn't have to be your whole yard, yeah. but if everybody did a section, which I thought was a nice, a compromise, you know, to having a good yard, but leaving just a little patch, you know, at least to have some growing to feed the bees, which I think is a good idea. So yeah, I, I, I thought that too. was worthwhile. Um, chamomile, uh, also a perennial that I love the tea. I love the tea. And you don't grow it. I tried. <laughs> I do. Oh, really? Yeah, I have. No, I have in the past and, and, but not in a perennial way. I grew it in pots okay. and then I, I tried to grow it in the beds last year. Again, it was one that failed on me. Uh, no, I didn't completely. It was one of them. I had like four or five come up. I had a little okay. bit come up, but not a lot. And I did use it for, uh, for some tea because I love chamomile tea. I love it. So I wanted to make it a bigger part of my of right. my homestead and grow yeah. more of it. But yeah, I have grown it in pots. When I, anything I've ever grown in pots, I don't tend to keep as a perennial. I, I, for some reason, I just forget what I had in the pot when it dies back and I end up dumping it out and starting over. And <laughs> Okay. Well, mine, so I don't know if it's technically considered a perennial. Mine okay. reseeds itself. So okay. it comes back. I would like to grow more of it. Um, here it's hardy. It's, it's hardy through zones three to nine but if you're going to start it from seed i didn't seem to have any issues starting it from seed um but okay. you should start it about six weeks early so depending on where your grow zone is you'll have to look up your grow zone which you had in the last podcast you had placed some links so yeah just six weeks before your what's considered yep. your last frost your day last on average frost last frost day yeah 
Yeah. So it is um, people, a lot of people use it for a tea, but you can use it for skin also. And it's used to calm and promote sleep. People use it for stomach issues. Um, it's a great companion plant in the garden. Mm -hmm. That's where I need to pest repellent. More yeah. in my guilds and things because I definitely want to use it for its companion plant qualities more. And like I said, I had planned on that last year and it just kind of didn't spread around like I wanted it to. Right. Yeah. This is another one that I want to plant in my fruit tree guilds. I didn't realize until I was researching for this because I was growing it for um, my other plants and it, and it attracts beneficial insects. Um, I didn't realize that it's actually really good in like apple tree guilds. I yeah. Love people I've heard that so too. I want to grow more of it just for that because I've put in a lot of fruit trees mm -hmm. um yeah so that I have I believe the one I'm growing is the Roman chamomile so, okay there's some different yeah. ones yeah I I don't even remember the ones I've grown um it's definitely something I, I'm going to try to make a bigger part of my homestead because I it is very useful especially because when you think about things you just use and we buy chamomile tea. I mean, we buy the know, chamomile tea bags and I'm like, it's just something we use. So it's like need to be growing a lot more of that for all the reasons, for the companion it's plant really benefits, for the pest, for the control, plus the actually yeah. just using it. Yeah. And for the health reasons, for sure. It's so prolific. You just, you use, I guess it depends on what you're using it for. But when I do the mm -hmm. tea, it's just, it's like the heads and it. mine gets just dozens and dozens of yeah. these little heads. And, um, but you can use it for, like I said, it calms the stomach down too, and people use it for skin, for hair. It's one of the few herbs that are really safe for kids to drink for tea. To yeah, you know, so it's just a really nice um, flower, and it's. I love all of these because they serve multiple purposes. Mm -hmm. Well, the next one, many people grow. We grow. Um, and, but I think a lot of people just grow because it's kind of the centerpiece of your garden. You know, it's like it, it creates this big, beautiful thing that everybody wants to look at. And that's the sunflower. And now there are different types of sunflowers. There's some that are small. There's some that are gigantic, like the mammoth. And I grew one this last year that was even bigger than the mammoth. It was a, um, I can't remember what it was called now, but it was even Ooh. a couple feet taller than a mammoth. I got it from really? Baker Creek. Yeah. I wish I could remember what it was called now. And it did. It got up there. 15 feet probably it was wow. big. yeah i've had a lot of mammoths get up around 12 feet you know i've had a lot of those but yeah um and they're just great to grow i love growing those big tall sunflowers they're so fun to grow and they grow so easy and they're an annual so again you got to plant them every year but you can just direct sow them because they grow so fast um yeah in, in mo they're, I mean, all throughout the United States, growing zones four through nine. So pretty much most places in the United States, you can grow sunflowers. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I like them for a lot of reasons, but what are some of the reasons you like to grow sunflowers? I like them because the birds like them. Unfortunately, yeah. the squirrels like them too. Yeah. <laughs> and they so, will. Uh, we had squirrels last year. We had squirrels climb ours and pull them down and break them. <laughs> <laughs> trying to get the seeds off of them. So and one of the problems I have with starting from seed in the garden is the squirrels will take off with the little seedlings. Yeah. So I'm going to have to figure out some way to keep the squirrels I, out. Yeah. Of I find I have to uh, hoop and cover mine with uh, a yeah. row cover for about the first three or four weeks at least till they get, yeah. and, but they grow so fast. I mean, that's a, you'll get a plant that's a foot tall. Yeah. You know, that quick. And and so as soon as they start getting to the top of the, where they're just about to touch the top of the row cover, these little hoops I've got, I'll uncover them and, you know, let them go. But and then they're pretty the safe at that point. I love them, though. And yeah. they're really good. Like they're great as sprouts. Even I know you've grown yeah. as my. Yeah, I grow them as sprouts. And that's yeah. why the squirrels like them. They are really good, even it, as little sprouts. They're and I think out of everything we're mentioning here today, this is probably the easiest thing to grow. And, oh, it's, yeah, and yeah. it's the most show off thing you'll grow because it just it gets up there where you can't ignore it. Everybody will see it's it. Really it's really fun, especially fun to grow. if you have kids. Like if yeah, you have kids, you can grow like a teepee. Um, you can climb stuff up them like beans or something. But yeah. I also, we also have started once they die back, because you can grow them also for the seeds. You grow those big mammoth ones. I, for the yeah, seed. I grow those ones for the seeds that I'll eat. Plus, I, I find that, you know, the birds like them. The, the rabbits will even eat them. You know, yeah. um, 
but I so like the rabbits them. eat the seeds even. They'll yeah, they'll munch on them, and okay. I do too. I eat them too. I mean, oh yeah, they're we, good. I, we take every year. I always get a bunch of them, and then I'll uh, I'll roast them, and then vacuum seal a bunch of them, and I'll just so kind of eat them throughout the year. And I'll grab. I'll have them in these little packets of vacuum seal packets that I make, and then I can just grab you know once every few weeks or whatever. I'll just think I need a snack, and I'll grab one of them and munch on those. See, do great. you roast them and and store them? Whole, like inside the seed. I do. Yeah. Okay. I, do. I didn't know if you shelled them. Yeah. Cause I just chew them and then spit out the, okay. the shell. And yeah. That's cool. I just like, I'm going to have to try that. I have never, yeah. like, I, either the squirrels have gotten mine or we have given them to our chickens. So I've never actually stored any for myself. But that's kind of what I would like to do. I've got a, thing. I've got a post on that. I need to, I'll add it to the show notes yeah, uh, on yeah. how I do it. Just uh, pictures of us roasting them, you know, putting in the salt water and, in a pan and doing that thing and then soaking them there. And then, you know, you salt them up, throw them in and roast them in the oven. And like I said, even vacuum seal them up to the whole thing, even how I get them out of the, those big giant mammoth heads, you know, you kind of have to break them up and you want yeah. to wear gloves when you do that. Cause them things actually are kind of sharp and they'll hurt your hand. You're like rubbing them out. Cause you kind of like push on them and just kind of roll, rub right, them out. Right. And, um, and, and yeah, it's, it's fun. Uh, my granddaughter, my grandkids, they love to gather around and help me get them out of there. Of course, they're trying to pick them out one at a time. I'm like, no, 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 you can't do that. <laughs> you just want to get them out. But, uh, something that I'd like to try is I would like to grow. Those are fun. The mammoth ones are, but I'd like to actually start growing more of the black, uh, um, the, uh, what do they call them? The, um, black oil, black oil, sunflower, sunflower seeds, seeds. Yeah. and actually getting them for the oil. Um, I read a, I was on permies.com and read an, uh, one of the posts in there. And a guy is actually harvesting the oil from those. And he gathers about five gallons of seed will make about five quarts of sunflower oil. Oh, wow. And I was like, that's a lot of oil. I mean, I was impressed. It and really he, is. And he bought the, and I put a link, um, an Amazon link of a whole bunch of different uh, presses uh, actually that will extract the oil. And I mean, some of them are, there's actually hand crank ones that are a little cheaper and they got motorized ones that I mean, up to like uh, all the way up to like $500. But if you were doing a lot of it, that would definitely be worth it. But um, there's some in the couple hundred dollars zone I thought would be really good. Uh, there were, were power. That's definitely a really cool idea and for sustainability. Yeah, right? for sustainability to make your own sunflower oil. So I thought that was interesting. I, I'll put that link to those those um, basically extractors uh, in the uh, show notes. Cause I thought that was a, that could be a whole nother level of self-sufficiency. I'm not really pursuing. We have a local company that grows sunflowers and makes yeah. oil and sells them. Yeah. They, they, it's actually a whole business for them selling that sun, local sunflower oil. It, it sounds like it's pretty productive though. I mean, if it five gallons, I mean, I, That's I, a lot. I mean, but it really wouldn't take, that much to get five gallons of sunflower seeds to make five quarts of oil. I mean, I was thinking about that. I was like, that's really not that. I mean, I've got a lot of sunflower seeds out for eating and I can, you know, get a gallon out of the, now these are the mammoth ones and they put out a lot more seeds. Right. I mean, the black oil sunflower seeds are a smaller sunflower than those, but they probably have more oil in them, but they have more oil in the yeah. seeds, So they're kind of better for that. So I don't know what it would take, how many you'd have to grow to get, say, five gallons to get, but you don't, even if you just got a couple quarts of it, it could be neat to experiment with and try. Um, and you, you could even get one of the cheaper hand crank um, oil extractors that are cheaper, like 80 bucks right. or something first and try it and see if it's something that's going to be a big part of your homestead and then maybe spend the money on a motorized extractor later and, you know, do more of that because that could be a really, that could be a money saver. And I mean, one of the things you use a lot in your house is oils like that. Yeah. And, and I mean, I know that I talk a lot about animal oils, but I'm sure yeah. that we have a few people that lean more vegetarian and or yeah. vegan. And that would definitely be a great way to supply oil for you. And it would just be a healthy oil that you're yeah. growing yourself. And, and yeah. yeah, so I think you know where it came from fun to, to do that too. So yeah, that's just something cool. I wanted to yeah. kind of sidetrack us on that a little bit. Cause I thought that was interesting. No. That is um, really cool. Now you like me also use yours for like a mulch too, don't you? Yeah, we sh we send them through. We have a leaf Would, mulcher. Yep, we wait until the they get thing. dry. Yeah, because they're easier to do when they're drier. And and um, I did this with corn stalks too. And we send them through the shredder. They're great. They there's just mm -hmm. a lot of it there once yeah. you shred it. It's really nice to use for your garden so none yeah. of it goes to waste you use that whole plant it's fantastic and you can make bird seed and fill your feeders up with it or or if you got chickens or even quail like i do if i put them in the tractor i'll if sometimes i'll just cut a whole head off throw yep. it in the tractor and let them just pick away at it and they love it chickens love that too they'll just tear it apart shred it and they'll eat yeah more i think than that's the, the best part about um 
you know, birds especially, because you can just, you can grow corn or a sunflower and just throw it at, you don't have to process it for yeah, them. You just anything. toss it in there. Toss, cut the head off and toss it in there. Oh yeah. yeah. And it keeps them busy and they love it. They absolutely love but it. Also, uh, another great thing to do. We could, I mean, I don't want to turn this into a whole sunflower episode, but Maybe other things, I just one. love, yeah, I just love using them as a trellis too. Like I'll grow pole beans yeah. right next to a sunflower and let it just climb up it and kind of thickens in. Like if you have a bunch of sunflowers together, you can just throw some pole bean seeds in there and let it just kind of have this intermix of, sunflower and beans all through your little patch and that's kind of neat too to do i like doing that yeah and i mean any and all of these and any of these too i mean it's something like we said before there's many different varieties um you can grow all sorts of different sizes of these and sell them as cut flowers too mm -hmm. my daughter when she got married sunflowers were one of her flowers for her wedding and i grew the flowers for her wedding so yeah, yeah people yeah. want pictures with them Sunflowers, for some reason, people just really love sunflowers. So yeah, oh, they're just fun to look at, and kids love yeah. them. And yeah, they're just they're just a great plant. I it's one that if you're not growing it, you should probably at least grow some sunflowers. If you don't grow anything else on the on this list, grow some sunflowers. They're fun. <laughs> they are, and they're yeah, kids love them. The next one's kind of a common plant for, in permaculture. Borage is is that how you pronounce yeah. it? Borage, I believe so. Yeah, I've heard it pronounced a couple different ways. Um, but, uh, it's, it's in permaculture. A lot of people are talking about this plant because of the usefulness of it. Now I've grown it. I grew it in the greenhouse a couple of times. I've grown it outside once, but I can't say I've made a lot of use of it other than just a plant that I just planted, kind of interplanted it in my garden. But I don't think I even used it for anything specific other than just as a, maybe a repellent pest repellent or whatever, as, as it was growing. I don't know. It does have uh, edible and medicinal benefits, but I never took advantage of that. So I'll let you tell me more about that if you've done that or if, if you're. If well, you we have. ate some of the flowers. Okay. I didn't, um, as far as medicinal uses, I know there are some. We didn't use it more, mostly for that. I planted it with my tomatoes to avoid okay. because yep. I kind of did that too. worms do not like them. I still um, had hornworms. Did you? No. I did. I really? I always have, I always have some hornworms. I don't See, know. See, I don't get them a lot, but when I started growing, I started growing tobacco. Okay. Because it's also beautiful, which I didn't put in here, but it's a beautiful plant. But they attract they also attract hornworms, the same family as tomatoes. And um so I didn't start getting them until I started growing some a little bit of tobacco and that's when I started growing borage. Plus I read how wonderful borage was and it gets pretty bigger. At least it did in my garden. It probably got 4 feet tall and the plants got really big and it's Reminds me a lot of comfrey and yeah. how it looks. It's a bit, yeah, it's a big plant, and it, yeah, yeah. So it does it has the, because of the leaf size and the size of the plant. It's great for like ground cover. I mean, just for it is, and yeah. then you can it creates. Of course, it's another thing you can add to your compost when mm -hmm. it's done. Because I have heard that. that. I think that's one of the things I've heard the most in the permaculture circles about borders is how great it is to add to your compost. Oh yeah, it's full yeah. of minerals and everything, yep. which helps with your compost. And it's a pretty big plant, so you get a lot of mass off of that for it. And I, um, it's supposed to be annual, but mine self seeded like crazy. Okay. So I would say that you might want to watch where you yeah, put it, I, uh, it, it. Mine just keeps coming back. Yeah. Okay. So, I, I yeah. think I only, I planted it with my tomatoes once outside, but I think all the other times I grew it, I actually grew it in the greenhouse to full size plant in the greenhouse. Okay. I had them like down, but I had, but I had some tomatoes greenhouse. in there also. And I, yeah, well, they didn't get, it didn't get as big in the greenhouse. Okay. Mostly because I just had so much other stuff crowded around it. But uh, yeah, I was growing them in the, the raised beds that I had in my greenhouse. And uh, yeah, it grew pretty big. It, it was pretty neat. Yeah. To have and in there. They're, they're kind <laughs> of, um, if you catch them young, the leaves are edible. But if you let the leaves get bigger, they do get a little bit prickly. Yeah. They eat, okay. The leaves and the flowers are edible. I need to try and, that around bees, my bees. Uh, the bees absolutely yes, loved it. Oh my word! Really all just, over it. Yeah, I remember. Just like comfrey, like my comfrey flowers, yeah, which we'll bees talk about here in a little bit about that with, yeah. with comfrey. Um, now, I, I think I want to try that around. The, the bigger problem I have with like hornworms is not with my tomatoes. It's actually on my eggplant. I don't know okay. why the hornworms love eggplant so much, but they are on it big time. And uh, so I might try to put that with my eggplant. Okay. Uh, yeah, that might, would be. It could probably use well, that. Well, and then, yeah, 
yeah, it would be a good plant to try awesome. with. I just, and the other thing I like too, is it's just, I love looking out on the garden. I love seeing rows of plants, but I also like looking out and seeing all the different variety in my yeah. garden, not just the same thing. I, I like, like big bushy plants. Varied. They're fun. Yeah. To, they take up a lot of space, but they look nice. And I don't know, they're, I, they'll catch your eye and yeah, Borge is definitely one of yeah, those. And they're purple. Sure. At least mine were, yep. they're a little like lavenderish flowers. Which is why it kind of reminds you of comfrey in some ways. Cause it's yep. kind of like that same color in, in some of them. And we're going to talk about hostas. Are you out there nibbling on your hostas, Rachel? Are you eating your hostas? If you catch them when they <laughs> just come up, the little <laughs> curls before they uncurl. They kind of almost look like an asparagus shoot, right? They, they kind of taste up. like yeah. asparagus. And they do. Too. If you fry them, if you kind of cook them like you do asparagus, I do yeah. the same thing. I've done it. I don't do it every year, but I have done it. I don't I, either. When I, when I first started hearing about it, I thought, I got to try that. I got to right. try yeah. it. So I went out there yeah. and I got some because when I read about it, it was like that time of the year, right? When they were popping up, I was like, right. Okay, they're about six inches, five, six inches tall. I'm going to go pick some of these and I'm going to try it. And I cooked them like asparagus and I'll be darned. They were pretty good. <laughs> they are pretty good. And they, and, but they do like their shade and they like a lot of water. But um, I, and I did not realize until I did this research, I've, because I've just never tried, is apparently you can grow them from seeds, but it's a little bit of work. Yeah. I've always just dug them up and kind of They're spread so them. They're so easy and, to grow from that. Yeah, I mean, we literally yeah. just take a sharp shovel, cut it in half, move or, it, and there you go. Root cuttings are basically, basically I've always spread them around and we've, we've got a lot of hostas around here and we got a lot, of, a lot of different kinds of hostas. Now, what I don't know is I kind of know that the one that is edible, I don't know if all hostas are edible. Do you know that? I'm not really sure. Cause there's so many, I shouldn't say, we all. shouldn't say yeah, because yeah. we don't know for sure, but um, Definitely there are a lot up, of different kinds yeah, of hostas. There are, right? there's different. I mean, we have, I would say we at least have six maybe yes. eight different varieties here because we have yeah. we have variegated we have ones that are more yellow yeah. we have ones that are a solid color we have really dark ones we have smaller ones we have big ones yeah and some of them do like are some more more shade tolerant than others some of them like sun more um like we do, we're just growing all different kinds i find those really big dark ones are the prettiest ones i love them i they're, love those too yeah they yeah. are so beautiful and i've got we those just love my them. Pond. i got like three different kinds around my pond even and they're just yeah, yeah they really they show it off it's they're we really grow nice. them we grow them under a lot of our trees because they're mm -hmm. really shade tolerant and then they're just nice because they they will help shade out um yeah. weeds and stuff and, yeah, and like i said around. they're so easy to um propagate yeah. you just and then they get big pretty quickly we have they're we have great for ground them. cover if you're trying to yep. just suppress weeds and things around trees or whatnot even if you're not even considering like um growing like medicinal and edible things around right. trees like a guild putting a bunch of hosses around a tree just keeps you from having to worry about having to weed around or mow around trees or weed yeah. around them or whatever. It's just nice ground cover if nothing else. And they look great. Yeah, I think that's, that's our biggest thing is we don't like to mow. So yeah. The least but I mean, I could even mow. see a benefit to some degree, like say you did have deer and rabbits and things like that, but you didn't want them to eat your fruit off your trees or actually eat the bark off your yeah. fruit trees and things like that. You could put a, a bunch of hosses around there and they would go for that oh, instead yes. of that's eating your tree. I would say that's probably the one drawback to hostas is they are like crack candy. To but deer. it can actually be they like I say, a, love them. it could be a trap crop to protect yep. your trees. Maybe. I mean, possibly. Yeah. So it yeah. The be deer, before we got the dog, cause we didn't have a dog for a few years, but when, now that the dog's here again, of course the deer avoid the yard because they can smell the dog, but they would come in and eat our hostas right down. To yeah, the they love them. They, they, they oh love my. them. <laughs> yeah. So, cause they're like asparagus. They're they might be hard them. to, they actually might be hard to grow if you have a lot of deer pressure because they, yeah. they might tear them up. We get this, we get these little bags that we used to hang now with the dog around. We don't need to, but there are bags that have, it was hot pepper and I believe blood meal. And they Just don't the, like, yeah. if you have those hanging near them, they don't like it. We would hang them in our fruit trees too. So yeah, it's a good idea. But the, so towards the fall, they will send up these tall shoots with little purple, I think they're mostly purple. Some mm -hmm. of them might be white. Yeah. And the flowers, are. those are the ones that I was talking about that are spicy. The I've never ate the spicy. flowers of the hosta. Yeah. I've only yeah, ate those the flowers sheath. are spicy. And that is the part of the plant that is supposedly have, has some like anti-cancer. Okay. I might have to try that then. You just, the eat them, you just eat them raw like a, in a salad or yeah, something. Yeah. Just throw them in. Okay. 
huh, I'll have to try that this year. I, I have never eaten, ate the flowers, but definitely have ate the shoots. And like yeah, I said, they're pretty just good. a little spicy. They're yummy. But then everybody's like, I love my hostas. I don't want to eat them. <laughs> but right. But if you're just like, eating like the asparagus. little flowers, you're not hurting any of the leaves. Right. And also, even yep. if you're eating the spears, though, it's kind of like it's to me, it's kind of like asparagus. You just pick randomly they come right. up so thick that you you can pick them just kind of sporadically all the way through your your patch and you're not hurting anything if anything you're probably no. thinning it out a little bit and helping it because yeah. i tend to have to divide mine and and thin them out anyway because they get so thick that yeah you know so yeah anyway great yeah we're Hulk's getting great so many there. of them but it is something that people don't normally think of as being a flower or yeah. medicinal or edible and i'll tell you this too uh there's so many people growing hostas that if you want to add them to your homestead, people will gladly give you a, yeah. a divide off of theirs because they, like I said, it doesn't hurt them and they're, sp- they spread and they, they, they just accumulate so quickly that, you know, people won't even hesitate letting you go out there and just take a few, take a, just take your shovel. Like I said, just divide them, take a few sections and throw them wherever you yeah. want them and they'll grow They They do great. So yeah, you yeah. only need a few leaves for its transplant. Right. You don't need yeah. like huge, huge. Bush. Yeah. You can just take some yeah. small, yeah, two or three leaves are on a, on a chunk there, and it'll take off more than likely. So, yeah, it's a great one to have. On well, I know that you probably grow this next one, too. Yeah, Over. I grow it, and I grow it both uh, just kind of it naturally grows here in one right. form, yeah. and then I planted the other form, so uh, another kind. So uh, clover is super beneficial. We use it. Yeah. I mean, it's just a great plant because it's great for your soil, for one thing. For now, sure. the white clover just grows in my yard like it's everywhere like if i don't mow we just have white clover it's part so of you my don't lawn get the, the purple not naturally i have to plant really? the red the, the red clover we okay. plant i plant it now it's bigger here in Indiana. Right. it's a bigger clover yeah. um and it's great it's really good for like rabbit feed and things like livestock feed it's really good for that they love eating that but it's really good for both kinds or the red more so than the white uh, even is a, a nitrogen fixer in your um, yeah. soil. But now the white is a perennial. So I won't plant that in my garden, obviously, because I don't want it yeah. coming up. But you can use the red as a cover crop and then just mow it down. And or, if you ever, uh, when you were a kid, did you ever pick the red clover and then take like each little individual flower off and eat it? No. Super, super sweet. Oh, when we were kids, we used to do that when we would walk home from school. (laughs) But it's really sweet. If you pull those little ends out, the tip, the white tip that was inside the Yeah, I'm just talking about like like a nectar. Pure sugar. Yeah, yeah. It's like pure sugar. Never tried that. Anyways, it's it's really good. (laughs) Yeah, it's a great, they're great plants. And I tell you, the white and the red, especially the the red and probably the crimson. And there's there's so many, there's a bunch of different kinds of clover, but the bees love it. I mean, I see the bees just going they crazy on it. it. Like I said, the white clovers, the, the the flower heads are a lot smaller, and it's a lot lower profile. Um, that's why I said it grows good in lawns because you can mow, mm-hmm. and it almost doesn't even take the flower tops off. Sometimes it's so low, um, and uh, so we don't. I don't mind it being there though, because I know it's good for the soil, you know. And um, but yeah, if you're growing the red clover, uh, bees love. Well, it. I mean, I have you so ever many. had it in a tea? I have had clover tea. Yeah, it's pretty okay, good. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah not the yeah, white, so the it's, red. It's another the red. one that's edible. Yeah. The red. Um, I don't. You know, the white might be edible, but the red I is mostly is, what yeah. people. Yeah, yeah, I think they all are. But the red is really basically the one that is used medicinally a lot by a lot mm-hmm. of people for, specifically for hormones, men mm-hmm. or women. So it's it's got a lot of medicinal qualities as well, and it's great for a tea to dry and. Um, there's actually a book that I have put in the show notes that talks about a lot. It has almost all of these herbs in it, to, ways to use them medicinally. Uh huh. Yep. That's a great one. Yeah. Especially, like I said, the cover crop world, permaculture, clover is huge. Now, I found that, like, um, this is if you had a larger property, especially putting in paths and trails. Mm-hmm. can be really expensive. If you're wanting to do like mulch trails or rock trails or whatever, it'd be really expensive. And it's actually difficult to maintain. Even if you put down landscape fabric or whatnot, weeds will still find a way. Yeah. So one of the good ways to do pathways 
is you know if you can't beat them join them kind of thing is white clover yes. or just clover in general is just plant that in your pathways and it's very <laughs> low profile and you could just mow it occasionally it'll cover up it'll prevent other weeds from coming up or even grass if you plant thick enough it'll just be that'll be your whole path it's going to you know anything that's planted along the edges it's going to be a benefit to that soil so it's going to provide nitrogen for the other plants along the edge of the pathways but it's going to provide enough cover to keep other weeds from coming up and like i said just mow it and it's so low profile anyway it's easy to mow and you don't have to mow it as often as you do grass and it makes great pathways so it's actually right. something i've transitioned yeah. to in a few of my areas um because of the main just the maintenance involved in it it's so much better so yeah that's another kind of benefit to clover that i like Okay, another one that uh, I started growing a few years ago because I had somebody on the podcast one time and they were talking about it. And I was like, I'll start growing that. And that was echinacea or coneflower. Yeah. A lot of people know it as coneflower. And a lot of people just grow it because it's beautiful. You know, it's just the it little very pretty. flower that just, it's easy to grow and it pops up and it's a perennial and you can direct sow it in early spring. So you don't really have to start it early or anything. Oh, I can. I don't know about you because you're short growing season, um, but it does seem to grow really fast. Uh, for growing zones four through eight. So it's common everywhere. It, and it's really good. And I didn't even know of some of the benefits of it, but I guess it's a really good for an immune boosting medicinal tincture. Like a lot of people will make a tincture out of it just to boost their immune system. And it's really good for that. And it's just really cool looking, like the purple uh, cone head yeah. flowers. They have them in different colors. I'm yeah, not sure ones, if all of the I colors are. The purple ones and they're nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the, I see the bees all over them. They love them. So it's a great pollinator plant, obviously. So it's drawing in the bees. Um, and it's just so stinking easy to grow. Do you grow it? Yeah, I have purple ones. I bought yeah, I um, ones. yellow flowers okay. this year yeah. that I want to try too. And I don't, I didn't look into it if it's just the purple that's the medicinal, but I know the purple is medicinal. I know, the, sure about I know the, the purple yellow. is, but I think, I think yeah. they probably all are. I don't know for sure, yeah. but yeah, I think they probably all are. Um but I just like it because it's hardy. It's pretty, hardy, super easy to grow, and and yeah, I like the dual purpose. One. Yeah, so, yeah, and I don't know that if it has any like companion planting benefits other than bringing in pollinators. I didn't really read anything like that, but just the beauty, the pollinator value, and to be right. able to make some additional tinctures out of. If that ain't enough reason, well, I don't know <laughs> what else is. Yeah. It just seems and like it's such a perennial. A great, I love things yeah. I don't have to replant and replant. I do too, and I I love things that are easy. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and it seems to be one that's really easy. I mean, I've never had any trouble growing it. The next Speaking one we'll talk easy. about. Yeah. The next one we'll talk about, everybody's heard me talk about a thousand times on this podcast. And, you know, I think of it as more of an herb, I guess, or maybe even a small bush than a flower. But because it has flowers that seem to be really great yeah. pollinator flowers, and we'll talk about that here a little bit. It's comfrey and comfrey. It just makes these little purplish flowers, blue to purple flowers, mm -hmm. these little bell shaped, like hanging flowers. And I've never really thought about growing it for the flower. Right. I mean, that's not why I grow comfrey, but man, I, it, when I'm walking around my yard, nothing has more bees on it. Bumblebees, right. especially yeah, than the comfrey flowers. They love it. They, love I it. mean, they are, on every flower, it seems like out there, there's mm -hmm. a bumblebee on it and they just love them. And, and so it is probably one of the best pollinator plants in my garden unintentionally. Like I said, it's not right. even the reason I even planted it, but wow, it, they, they love it so much. If you're going to, now you plant, yours isn't a hybrid variety. Mine no. is, I suggest yeah. you plant a balking four or 14 hybrid. I suggest that now too. Yeah, because <laughs> if you plant the uh, common comfrey from it's seed, invasive. it's very invasive. Yeah. Very. Um, now, if you have a hundred acres and you don't, and you got pastures that you want it to grow like that to feed your livestock, yeah, go with common comfrey. If you're in a, if you're planting it close to a garden or anything, oh boy, yeah, you want your balking versions, you want your hybrids, because they spread. The reason how you spread those is by roots. You cut the root cuttings and and uh and take root cuttings or crowns and you locate them where you want them and then they stay there they don't the seeds aren't viable right so that's what you want it's especially on a smaller property or around a garden that's what you want um i use it there's so many reasons i use it. i've done whole podcasts on it I, i'll link to an article i've written 10 ways to use comfrey on your homestead yeah, there's just so many um, ways. but i use it for the pollinators for fertilizer for animal feed and and medicinal so mm -hmm. those are just the common ways i use it but there's other things as well 
it is such a valuable plant. It is the plant I have the most of on this property and my favorite plant on this property. So I would um, say that every homestead should have it. I, I think so. You can yeah. grow it. I think every homestead yeah. should have and it. And growing zones four through nine, most people can grow it. I've yeah. heard of people down south actually having trouble growing it. Um, uh, I've managed to kill it by drowning it, by, but I've never managed to kill it in any other way. Um, yeah, I think I killed one of mine by drowning it. Too. We will say that where you put it, plan on it always being there because yeah. it sends down a 10 foot or more deep tap root that will that continue not, to come yeah. back. Um, and now if it's in a place where you're going to mow, you'll always, you'll always be able to like, I had a path that I put in one time and I planted comfrey all on that path. Cause I was doing as a weed barrier. Right. And it worked great. It kept the weeds, the grass from creeping, the crab grass from creeping into my pathway and mulch pathway. And I did it as an experiment. Well, then at some point I didn't want that path there no more. So I replanted grass seed there. So I see it coming up to this day. And I, that path has been down for three or four years now. And to this day, I still see the, the comfrey starting to come back up as I get ready to mow. But then I mow. So it's not an issue, right? I keep it cut down. Yeah. So it doesn't get big. But it will always, if I stopped mowing, there'd be comfrey plants there. Oh, yeah. Yep. That's it what, will that's always what come back. Too. Yeah. I, I doesn't kill it because I keep mowing it. It just doesn't. It continues to come back and back yeah. and back. But I always just, you don't notice it if you mow it. So I would say if you plant it in an area where you could just start mowing, it would never be an issue. But don't put That's it in a place those, where you want a garden to grow. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's one of those, tr because not only does it have a lot of um, fertilizer qualities, it's a great thing for your fruit tree guilds or, or yes. any kind of guild is it's also because the bees visit it so often. Yeah. So if you need your Great apple pollinators. trees pollinated, I mean, you have that comfrey right there with the bees yep. flying around and then the flowers come and, out and they pollinate your tree. It's and one of my, great one of the things I love about it most is brown trees is the ground cover because yep. it really helps retain moisture and, and around that tree. The, the three trees that are, that grow the best on my property are my pear trees. All three of them pear trees, there's nothing around them but comfrey at this point. That's the guilds right. around them is comfrey. And, but they retain moisture so well. I think it's what helps them trees do so well. Yeah. Yeah. That and probably the reason I get so many pears is because of the pollination probably that contributes with that. And also yeah. because I just let those things go, I just let them grow and they get pretty tall. I mean, comfrey plants will get, you know, they can get two to three feet tall, you know, if you let them yeah, go as big will. as they'll get. Well, I'll do that. I'll take a few cuttings from them and spread out throughout the year. But then, you know, late summer, I just let them go from that point. And I let them get as big as they want. Well, then they kind of lay down uh, for the winter. And they'll make like this big mulch pile of comfrey leaves around the tree to kind of help insulate it yeah. for, for winter. It, it's just great. No mulching around those trees. I don't have to do anything. And so it's just this, it really makes it easy to take care of those trees. Now it, it limits my guild. I mean, there's one thing around those trees. So I kind of wish I would have maybe, and I could go in and plant some taller stuff that might grow between it, you know, in the spring or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's a great, it's a great plant to have around your trees for sure. Well, and you can use it like a, in a one of the medicinal uses for it. It's great for medicinal use, with mm -hmm. like your skin, like yep. turning it into a salve. It will heal a cut. Yep. Flat out. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And I know a <laughs> so, lot of people talk about it helping with joint issues. And, yes, you know, I it, think it's like one of the names for it is bone knit. Yeah. Like, it, yeah. It, it healed a cut so well that you got to be careful what kind of cut you put it on. Yes. Because if you have a deep wound, you don't want to put it on that because it can actually heal the skin over that without healing it kind of from the inside up. Right. Um, exactly. And actually can trap bacteria and things in there. I mean, it can actually create the wrong kind of healing. I mean, it can actually heal it yeah. too fast. Yep. So you actually have to be careful. It's good for scratches and things like that, abrasions, but yeah, deep cuts, you probably don't want to use it on. Yeah. I've heard you don't either. Yep. Yeah. So, so yeah, there's just some of the, again, just a great hey, plan. I always feel like we need to throw this in. Let's throw it in there. We're not doctors. We don't give medical nope. advice. It, just do your own research, consult physicians if necessary. But you know, these are the things that it's kind of the documentations out there that this is, what it does <laughs> and yep. i have some personal experience that it works good on cuts so <laughs> yes same here same here um another one we can talk about are lilies oh, true yeah. lilies there are different kinds of lilies that are true lilies yes. true lilies because there are some that aren't edible 
true lilies yes, are edible. For sure. These include your Chinese lily, your orange day lily, and your tiger lily. We have a ton of tiger lily on my property. I have tiger lilies and day lilies, and they procreate pretty easily. <laughs> I'm going to say, I'm going to say this. Comfrey grows fantastic and quick and you can't kill it. The only thing on my property that will outgrow Comfrey are my tiger lilies. <laughs> yep. Yep. They <laughs> just, they they're really like prolific. Crazy. Yeah. They will root. They kind of spread the roots kind of, they go out, they almost look like peanuts in the ground. Have you ever dug them up and looked at it? Yep. It's like yeah. these little balls of like peanuts almost through the ground. And they just like, I had them show up. Like I was digging. Okay. I have some planted about 10 feet away from my greenhouse. When I was digging those, I told you I put the aquaponics system in my greenhouse, right? And I dug the trench to put in my bed, my my uh, pond area for the in inside the greenhouse. Ten feet away are the tiger lilies. There were tiger lily roots and bulbs in in the ground under my greenhouse that were starting to come up where I dug oh, yeah. them up, and I was yeah, like, they, ten feet away. They just you can't. They went under a pathway under the landscape fabric and came up in my greenhouse. Despite that, I still like them. <laughs> yes. Uh, Barry, uh, well, I was talking about dandelion heads earlier about as far as eat, uh, frying the... the. Um, oh, yeah. You can eat that. You can do the flowers. same thing with the flowers on these and are great, too. They almost taste like mushrooms and also. These, are, these actually would probably be even better for something like that because they get a little... They they're get, quite they're a huge. Bit. Yeah. yeah. They're like pretty big. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and you can just eat them in a salad. You can just pick the petals and eat them in a salad. I mean, they're they're all edible. Um, you can probably perennial, find some for free from somebody because, yeah. yeah, that's how we got them. There was a, a friend of my wife's. She was like, take them. They're crazy. Yeah. And we planted some and yep, they're crazy, but I like crazy things on my homestead. I love it. And they're, they're pretty. I mean, they really, they are pretty, they're beautiful. Um, but yeah, you, it's another thing that's really hard to get rid of. So be careful where you place it because you'll always have them probably in growing yep. zones five through nine. They're, there are an aggressive perennial. Yeah. And they, they're, but they're so pretty. They're the they're a taller one. Mine are probably yeah. three three ish feet. Three tall. feet. Yeah, I would say that's mine too. And yeah. they're great for pollinators. I see the I see the bees on them a lot. I see butterflies coming towards them. I see a lot of stuff getting on them. So they're they're just a great pollinator uh, plant. Um, again, do some homework. Get the true lilies because there are some lilies that aren't true lilies. And yes, be careful. They're 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 toxic or poisonous. I don't know what the right term is for those, but you can't eat. Yeah, them. they are. I have. So um, do some homework. I don't want to name names because I want people to do their research, but yes. I have one here that I would not eat. Yes, yeah. there are some you should yeah. not eat. So only the true lilies. And like I said, do your own research on that and get the right ones. Yep. But uh, yeah, very good, but not all are good. <laughs> I say all, they still be great to have for for well, pollination so and things and like that. And just, yeah, showing off, but they're, they're not edible. The, some of them aren't edible. So again, right. do your own hunt, homework on that. Uh, one I was surprised you didn't add early on in the list was yarrow. I almost did. I was going to say yarrow is a I have one it. I love. Yeah. We grow some yarrow it here. Too. It's a perennial. Uh, and I grow it in my guilds. And it's a great guild plant because it has so many benefits for uh, a companion planting for pollinators yes. and beneficial insects. Um, and it's easy to grow. Yeah. Once you get it started, it's pretty easy it's to It's so easy. Yeah. yeah. And it, like I said, it's a great perennial. It's one of them you don't have to do anything with. And um, it's often used as a, as a herbal tea and there's some mm -hmm. other medicinal ways people use it as well. Um, but I think I just grow it mostly for the companion plant that it is, uh, in my guilds. Cause yeah, again, it doesn't, the nice part about this companion plant is a lot of the ones we've talked about were a little bit bigger. This one's a little bit shorter. So yeah, it's yeah. Nice so you can to get a lower profile plant so you can yeah. plant other stuff around it. It's maybe a little, a little taller, um, and it isn't going to block out. Um, yeah, and there's like, that. there's different colors too. I have yellow and white. I have only yellow. So I, yeah, I okay. didn't want sure about that, but yeah, that, they're great plant to grow. Um, I hear that potentially they can like keep, they don't just, um, draw in beneficial insects, but they can actually keep away some pests as well. So Ooh, I'm going to have to look into that. Yeah. There, I don't, didn't get a list or anything on it, uh, for this, but yeah, might be one we actually do a whole episode on at one point. Cause I like it so much and there's so much to say about it. I don't even want to say too much about it here. There is a lot. I, I actually would like, wouldn't mind doing a whole episode. We on should, it. we okay. should, because yeah, I, think I be a good one. yeah, I bought seeds for it. Last year was the first year I actually grew it. After doing a lot of research, I realized what a wonderful plant. There's it was. a list of benefits for you. Really long list. Uh, we could probably just about do an episode on most of these we're talking about today. Oh, yeah. Do a whole individual episode because most of these have so many benefits. 
that we're just not even touching yeah. because there's just not time to go through 17 of them in the detail that we would like to, but we could do whole episodes on a lot of these and we oh, might yeah, we at some could. point, we, we might, because there are some real benefits to so many of them, but yeah, that or, Yaro is definitely one that I, I highly recommend growing. So. This next one you have talked about a few times yes. and I have seeds for, but I've never grown it. I love growing it, grow it every year. This year we grew a lot of it because I used it as a, uh, a decoration. Basically we have the wall right. in front of our property that goes all along our sidewalk. And but we should name it. Nasturtiums. Yes. <laughs> and I planted, I just, I literally, it was kind of late spring too, when I decided to do it. Cause there's nothing there. I thought, man, I just need something on this wall. This is looks so, and I hate, I hate, uh, weed eating along this wall because I don't know this is when you're running a weed eater with a string, nothing will eat up. Well, there's two, there's one thing that'll eat up weed eat string faster and that's chain link fence. But another thing is like landscape rocks, right? There's landscape yes. stones and it's a landscape stone, a landscape stone wall. And when I'm running the weed eater along there, it just eats the string up really fast. Cause I'm hitting those rocks and it just grass grows right up to it. And I thought, I want to plant something here so I don't have to get up next to this wall. So it was kind of right. like, I wasn't even thinking for all the other reasons. I mean, I grow nasturtiums because you can eat them. They're great in right. a salad. They're kind of, I said earlier, there was a plant I talked about. It's kind of peppery and spicy nasturtiums. Um, the, we drop them in salads. You can drop the flower or the, the leaves and flowers or in, in a salad and eat them. And they're really good, but they're a little spicy, a little peppery. Yeah. Uh, and I like them though. Um, I wouldn't just sit there and munch on them by themselves though. Cause they, I think they're a little strong, a little, little you know, nice to eat with, uh, with other things. Um, but anyway, along this wall, I just, late spring, I just bought several packets. I went down to like, I don't know, was Walmart or Real King or something, just bought several packets of them. And I just sprinkled seeds all the way down through. Well, I did run my rototiller down through there and softened, you know, mixed up the soil along the wall. Right. And just sprinkled seeds all the way down through there. And then just took my hand and kind of just roughed them in. And within a few weeks, we had these nice nasturtium bushes all the way down along that wall. Well, then they, the way they kind of grow, they kind of grow out and they hang over. And now I have been ordered by my wife from now on and forever that we will always grow those nasturtiums along that wall because they were so beautiful. I mean, they were just oh, a high piece. Cool. She's like, we got to have those every year. So I will plant them a little earlier this year because it ended up being like summertime before we kind of really had the flowers. Uh, okay. But um, you can plant them. They actually do better in cooler weather. I was going to say, are they easy to care for? They they actually started browning a little bit in the heat of summer, but we okay. had an extremely hot and dry summer. Yes, this year. we all did. So, yes. And I watered them a lot to keep them kind of alive because they started browning a little bit and I just kept watering them. Um, and I noticed the ones, there's the ones more towards the north end of our property, the like shade half day from our house did better than the ones in direct sun. Um, but they do like cooler weather a little bit okay. better. Now, you did probably you save have the seeds. I did not, but the seeds okay. are edible as well. And people okay. actually make things out of them. Really? Uh, uh, make dish. There's a dish. I can't remember what it is. Interesting. Uh, See, I love this. And I didn't know that till this year because somebody in our Facebook group, the Homestead Front Porch Facebook group, for those of you who haven't joined, you need to be a part of that. Um, they actually told me about it. So it's something you make out of That's it. I was, fun. I was like, interesting. So I, I should have looked that up. I forgot what it was, but I didn't. Mine didn't because we had such a hot and dry year. They actually started dying before I got to seed collection time. Okay. So, but I think on a, a mild year, they would have looked great all year with some with with some heavy watering, probably. Right. Throughout in direct sun, especially. But they were just beautiful. Um, some things that I've learned about them though is is again, the entire plant is edible. They attract beneficial insects and they're a great trap crop for harmful insects, like aphids and things like that. I guess love them. So it'll draw them away from your garden. So you probably don't want to plant them like right next to your plants, but away from your plants a little bit to draw them away from it. Um and the thing I used them for along that wall was for ground cover, and they were perfect. No other grass, no other weeds, nothing had room to grow. They just. Oh, I, I they love that idea. I mean, I have a couple cover. of walls. I need to try to grow that up then. Yeah. And just, I guess they're an annual in zones four through eight, but they're a perennial in zones nine through 11. Okay. So, well, which that's I didn't not know us, but it might be other perennial. people. Yeah. I didn't know they were ever a perennial, but I guess if you're way down south, there's. <laughs> right. Down to the equator anyway. I guess they're a perennial. Um, so, yeah, you could grow them that way. But I love them. They're a beautiful plant. And uh, I didn't notice them being a big – they say they attract a lot of beneficial insects. But what I actually read was 
um, I didn't read the, so much. It was pollinators. It was like ladybugs and um, oh. a few other. There was a few uh, that got but mentioned. Ladybugs are always nice to yes, have. Yes, they're great to have, but they attract a few few other kind of beneficial. Okay. Not Because I didn't notice the bees on them so much because the flowers are pretty flat and small. And I didn't notice okay, them being yeah. a big pollinator. These definitely plant. like those Right, the different shape flowers. Yeah, there's certain yeah. kinds they like better. So I didn't notice them being a big pollinator attraction as much as it, what the claim is. It's more of just other beneficial okay um, insects, which you want a good mixture. So I think you this do, might yeah. be a good option for those other kinds of uh, plants to to draw on different kinds of beneficial insects. So there's that one, and kind of yeah. close it up here with what I feel is like a common one for yeah. gardeners. I know it is for you and I both, and that's the marigold. I love it. Have you yep. ever grown them from seed? I have not. I, I tr- usually, this I, I is did. one plant. I usually go buy oh. a flat of it at a local nursery. Oh, I did. Okay. I, I was getting ready to say I I did one year in the greenhouse, but it's not true. I actually did grow them from seed a couple times outside and they did great. And they were it, recently what I've been doing is just going down and buying the trays of them, like a Walmart or something. I right. just interplant yeah. them because for time, but one year, there's a bunch of different kinds of marigolds. You got really short yes. ones. Yes. And you got some really tall ones too. And I thought, oh, I'm going to pick these ones. They said they get like five to six feet tall. Have you ever grown those? No. Okay. I did not know. Be that careful where you grow them because they get huge. Yeah. There's these ones that are huge. And they're are they bushy too? They're not so bushy. They're mostly just tall and long. Um, But I actually planted them along my greenhouse one year. I could probably drop a picture because I think I have a picture of them growing along my greenhouse one day along my walkway. I didn't even not even know that. And there's right along a walkway. Well, there was a bad place to actually grow them because they got so tall they were actually shading part of the greenhouse. Oh no! And they started like falling over because they were so big and tall. They were falling over in my walkway, and I was having to cut them because they kept falling in my walkway. So I guess you kind of want to be careful where you grow them. But yeah, I've only grown like your normal looking ones that are like bush, like you know flowers yeah. in the garden but they they um the, another thing about that and one of the great reasons you grow them is because they're really aromatic they put off a really yes. strong smell but i would not call it a great smell how about you i do no? not like the smell i of do them, not but like I think the that's, smell but that's why i grow them is because yes right because yeah. they're a deterrent with their smell yes. i think of not so much of a deterrent as a mask they mask i've actually read that it's more of a masking smell than a deterrent smell um they will actually mask out the smell of the plants that your bugs are wanting to get to because they can't smell it over the marigold it's not that they hate the smell of marigold they just can't smell the better stuff behind it um so it's great for that so i plant these across i had raised beds across from my greenhouse so i planted these tall ones thinking oh that'd be great you know it'll mask the smell of my plants that i have here in these raised beds and I had to walk by them on the pathway every time I went in my backyard. And like you said, the smell is, I don't find it great. No, and it not. would just be overwhelming. Like when you'd walk down that pathway, cause they were like, they're like yeah. six feet tall. So they're right up in my face. You know, when I'm walking by them, they're even falling over and I'm brushing up against them. And I was like, okay, this will never happen again that I will plant these right here. <laughs> it was bad. Cause they, and my wife was complaining about them. She's like, those things smell horrible. And I'm like, yeah, they do. So yeah, they're not a, something you benefit. grow because they smell good. That's for sure. Yeah, right. But I didn't even know until a couple of years ago that they were edible. Yeah. Did you know they were edible? I did not know they I were did. edible until a couple yeah. years ago, but I've never eaten one of you. Um, I have not ate them. I have saved them and used them for like coloring and soap and okay. stuff like that, okay. yeah. or like steeped them in oil to then use in soap, but I've never actually ate them. I think the smell keeps me from wanting to try them as right. an edible. Yeah, it's plant. not one of those, oh, I would like to try that. Right. It doesn't make you desire to eat it by smelling it. Now, the saying that, it might taste completely different than it smells, and it probably does, but it doesn't smell good. But right. I'd rather have calendula. Thanks. But it is known and it is common for gardeners to use this as a as a companion plant in your garden. And I think it I think it's a great one. I really do. I I just I buy if I'm not growing them from seed, which I haven't the last couple of years. Um, yeah, I just I buy only trays have so of them much room and I just yep. pop them everywhere. I just pop one here, one there. I just kind of sporadically plant them everywhere. And it's an annual. It'll die back. It's not going to like spread or anything like that. Now, I guess they oh. do. You could save seed, I suppose. And I guess they can drop their seeds, which I've never had it happen to where they just plant themselves. So maybe in some, maybe down south further or other places, maybe it happens more, but it doesn't 
for me. It never has. But I guess if you're going to plant them from seed, you can plant them indoors eight to 10 weeks before your last frost date, transplant them. I've direct sowed them though. Like I said, those big tall ones, I just direct sowed them and they did great. Yeah, they I have tried fat. to direct sow them and not had the greatest luck. Yeah, I haven't outside. I have grown them in the greenhouse. I did yeah. plant some in the greenhouse early and I did transplant those ones. But those tall ones, they grew so fast. Right. I didn't need to. So if you got well, a those, location where that would work great, those might be great right. for direct sowing. Yeah. And for me, I just only have so much room to grow things because I don't have a greenhouse like you do. So it's one of those that's more popular that you can find at greenhouses where some of the other things I grow are kind of, would be hard to find at a greenhouse. So I usually expensive. Just, yeah. yeah so I usually just go buy a flat at a local. Yeah. yeah. That's a great way to do it. So that we'll close it up with that one. I think those are a great list and there's hundreds we probably could have listed. Those are some common ones. Some of these are common ones and, and what the ones that we grow. Um, but I think it's a great list. And it's a great place to get started. And you might, even if you just pick three or four of those off the list, try growing some yeah. of these. I think it can be a bit, find the ones that you think will be the most beneficial for you. And, yeah. um, you know, try to grow them. Some links we had in the show notes. I did put the link in for those seed oil presses. On Amazon, yeah. you can go check that out and kind of look that up. But that's something, again, I'm, I've am i been thinking a lot about self-sufficiency these last couple of years, especially. And oil is something I, I buy a lot of. You know, we buy a lot of oils. We buy like olive oil. And, but if you could grow an oil that you could cook and use on salads and things like that, that's wow, how so much cool. better I'd could that to, be? That is so really cool. I think I might be looking into that. Yeah. Um, and I just seen, that's funny because we were, I was preparing for this podcast and I just seen that link this morning. It showed up in my email from Permese and well, I went I and checked it out. My email yeah. I went yet. and checked yeah. it out and I was like, check that out. And that's when the guy was talking about, it. he gets about five quarts from five gallons. And I'm like, so okay. I wonder how many you have to grow to get five gallons of seed. I don't know because it's, it's the black oil. They are a right. little bit smaller seed head on those yeah. than like the mammoths. So I don't know, but if you could put up a nice patch of them, though, that's I suspect a Harold's going to have a nice little a nice uh, sunflower patch, patch this year. <laughs> the black, yeah, I'm, and actually, you know what? I've actually uh, never even grew the black oil sunflowers. I bought I don't those. Think I have either. I bought well. I bought them to sprout. I buy those okay. to sprout yes. for my yes. for my. Um, but I've never actually grown them in my garden outside. Well, there you go. Um, but I might. I think that, and they grow really easy for sprouting. So I would think they would grow super super easy. Um, you could probably just take a four by eight bed or something patch out in your ground just throw them in there thick and let them go i don't know but i'd like to try this i think it'd be kind of fun i might try one of them cheaper hand crank presses first to you yeah know, yeah to i didn't even look what kind of like oil. does it look a lot like a like a meat grind like a hand crank it meat does look like a meat yeah it kind of does yeah the the well the hand crank ones and the uh electric ones both look a lot like that but yeah they look like they'd be super easy to use and get your oil from and i'm going to look into that a little bit more because that sounds fascinating to me and i want to do it um i also have a link in there about how to make a tincture because we talk a lot of these uh you can make tinctures out of them for medicinal reasons yes and some people just may not know how to make a simple tincture there's a nice uh, blog post from Mountain Rose Herbs that I put a link in for how to make a tincture. It's just super simple, and everybody should know how to do it. And then you added a a, a link as well. Yeah, I added a link for what, like I said earlier, it's one of my favorite books. It's called Body into Balance. Okay. And it, like almost every one of the things we talked about here mm -hmm. today, they use in that book awesome. herbally okay. for medicinals or for um either to ingest or put on your skin. So that's a book I yeah. need to have on my shelf. It sounds like it is a really, stuff. really nice book. Great. Well, folks, so that's, I think all we have for you today. You have anything else you want to add, Rachel? No, I think, I think that's it right here well, where I'm at. I think I'm at like 16 weeks till my last frost. Or no, something. You're getting close to start close dropping to some seeds then, aren't yeah. you? Yeah. Well, I, some I, people I, might be closer than yeah. that. Well, I think we gave some people uh, some options or some ideas on maybe some plants they want to grow or some flowers they want to add to their garden this year. And you know what? I think you should. And there's a few of these I wasn't growing that, Rachel, you've convinced me I need to get these going on my property. So same I hope we here, can influence some folks to uh, to do this. And you know what? If nothing else, your homestead is going to be a lot more beautiful having all these flowers around. <laughs> <laughs> right exactly because i just love to look out and uh, i mean i have i have flowers that are growing on my property that have no 
purpose other than just they're beautiful. Right. They're just they just yep. make you feel good to look at them, and that's okay, you know. <laughs> so, uh, have fun with it. Grow grow things that are fun, not just things that are completely useful. So, but if you can get some use out of them, hey, we like to function stack, even right? Even <laughs> that's better. right. It's even yes. better. So, folks, until next time, happy homesteading. God bless and grow where you're planted. Looking around, I finally see I think I need a change The rat race I want to flee My world I'll rearrange I'm getting back to the roots Of how it's meant to be Growing gardens, picking fruit Racing livestock, living free It's a Like grandma did, sitting on her front porch, hunting and fishing like a kid. Once you've done all of your chores, it's a modern homestead. Build a modern homestead. Country or city, there's a way to make this change. You've got. Today